Good morning and welcome to our adult Sunday school lesson for Sunday, July 18, 2021. Prepared for the NAS at North Lake. Last week was the last lesson taken from the letters to the Thessalonians. This week is the first lesson of a seven week unit titled Timeless Messages for the Journey. And today's lesson is a time for everything with the long subtitle of although the challenges of life are many times out of our control we have hope because god is sovereign over his creation now last week we learned that christians are called to action and not idleness and this week we will learn that each season of our life gives God's spirit opportunity to reveal the nature of his character. Our planned outcome for today is to understand that we can have hope because God is working even when we do not see it. And our scriptures for today is Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 through 14. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes is all about uh, perspective. It is about taking a long look at life, but not from the usual vantage point. It is a book that questions a view from the valley and attempts to rise above to get life's big picture. The book of Ecclesiastes almost didn't make it into the Bible. It was seen as too skeptical in nature, and it broke from the optimistic tradition of God's people of hope. Perhaps it was only the strong ties of Ecclesiastes to Proverbs and Solomon that gave the book some much needed credibility during the time when the rabbis were deciding whether or not to include the work among the Old Testament books. As it turns out, one rabbi's opinion, that of Hillel, around 15 BC, swayed his contemporaries, and the book was included among the Holy Scriptures. Still, the argument against it continued in Christian circles, it continued for 400 more years. The reasons for questioning it were always the same. It seemed to have contradictions and didn't uh, have the normal hopeful view of things. It didn't sound like scripture. Yet, its appeal is honest, its presentation beautiful, and its testimony truthful. So, who wrote Ecclesiastes? Well, the name Ecclesiastes means one who assembles or the preacher or the teacher. The writer's own perspective on life was put into a collection of writings uh, meant to teach or to instruct. So who is a teacher? Well, many believe it was written by King Solomon but his name does not appear in the book. Some biblical scholars say the book was written between 400 and 200 BC, quite some time after the life of Solomon. Now it would not have been unusual in that day for a student of wisdom who was an admirer of Solomon to compile a book and attribute it to him. Most of it may have been things that Solomon himself had said. Without more evidence, we are left without a definitive answer. So many scholars today refer to the author simply as the teacher. So what is Ecclesiastes about? Well, Ecclesiastes is a collection of observations that question the rosy view of life. The author takes a step back to look at the way life really is warts and all. The book 
raises questions about meaning and truth. The teacher was not willing to accept the standard viewpoint without testing it first. From the author's viewpoint, two things stand out. First is the idea of human limitations. People die. Our knowledge and thinking are limited. A human being, as human beings, we are limited in our understanding. We can't fathom the nature of the way of God or the ways of God. We know that our wisdom is insufficient. We are limited to our own experience of life. You know, God alone is free and unlimited in this universe. The second idea is the meaningless nature of life here on earth. The second verse of the book says it all. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. The author contends that human existence is full of meaningless pursuits. The very way we sustain ourselves in work, the activities we spend the most time pursuing, is pointless. This idea may seem depressing, but it helps us to look reality square in the eye. There are many things people pursue that they think will bring them pleasure, but in the end, only leave them wanting. People fill their lives with things to the exclusion of God. There are idols we erect and allow to take the place of our life, place in our lives that only God should occupy. People sometimes lose perspective on what is important. Sometimes they need to be lifted higher to see the full picture. Ecclesiastes reminds us that the only thing worth pursuing is God himself. Our teacher has taken an honest look at life and has put this judgment down on paper. There are great lessons to be learned if we will look closely enough to find them. We must take seriously that our lives are short and death is real. There is futility in the pursuit of pleasure. The only true good thing that comes out comes a little, little. The only true good thing that comes our way are the gifts that God gives us. All of these are clearly seen in the view from the mountaintop. Ecclesiastes helps us to remember to remain humble. We don't know all there is to know about God or even how to run our own lives. Ecclesiastes reminds us that our knowledge can be as fleeting as vapor. But God remains forever. Think about it. Meaning is found only in a God-centered view of life. The essence of life is an awareness of beauty, an assurance of eternity, and a recognition of the value of the present moment. This calls for wholehearted obedience and solemn worship of God on our part. Ecclesiastes takes a very honest perspective on human life and challenges us to see where God is working, which is everywhere and in everything. There is no human experience that God does not know or care about. Okay. Connecting with our experience. Okay, think about a time in your life when everything seemed to be going wrong. Now, think about a time when everything seemed to be going well. 
You know, it, you know, everything was in its rightful place. So when things are not going well in your life, what is typically your response? That's our first question. You know, when I was younger in age and in the Lord, I would start searching for some way to change the situation in my own strength. Well, now I've changed a little bit. I got older and uh, I don't know if any wiser or not, but anyway. Uh, now I tend to thank God for being there with me and ask for his guidance and help. You know, we are told to be thankful in all things because God is our help and he is our heavenly father. So what is your response when things are going well? Well, I wrote down, I thank God and look for his guidance and help because he is our help and our heavenly father. I think it's we our reaction should be somewhat the same. Unfortunately, quite often we uh, think everything's great and we just kind of forget about God. And that's the wrong direction there, right? Our transition, our text today reminds us that there is a time for everything, good and bad, difficult and easy. As we dive into the passage, many, I mean, the passage, may we be reminded that God has made everything beautiful in its time. So connecting to the word, our first uh, scripture we're going to read is just, Ecclesiastes 3, 1, just the one verse. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under, under the heavens. Now, note that when the writer uses the term season, the teacher is not referring to the four seasons we experience in terms of the way that weather changes, but rather to the period of time in which we experience something. Whether that experience is good, that something is good or bad, it's a time that we experience a certain something. So what do you think the writer means by a time for everything? Is anything excluded from this? If so, what? Now, when I looked at this question, I have to say for each person, everything means that there is no exclusions for what may come our way. But I also know that I will not have every possible experience, good or bad, during my life. I think that it may be better expressed as nothing is excluded from what can happen. Not necessarily what will happen, but what can happen. You know, God is the one in control. And what I experience is either his will for me, or it's the result of my not following him as I should. I know God has promised to be with me in the sunshine and in the storm. So whatever he brings my way is up to him, right? And how I respond to it can be up to me. How might the writer use of time in our passage differ from our common understanding of time? You know, as humans, we are very much aware of time. We watch the clock. We check our cell phone. We set alarms and our day is almost ruled by how we schedule our time. God, on the other hand, lives outside of time. Being eternal, his time is as diff his timing is different from ours. I believe time is subject to God's will, unlike us. God has time for everything. 
under the heaven. You know, the passage, this passage challenges us to think of time in terms of God's time. How could, how could understanding time in terms of God's time and benefit us as the people of God? You know, maybe if we understood God's timing, it would not be hard for us to be still and see that he is God. We would not have to worry, or we would not worry about tomorrow or how the issues in our life are going to all play out. Our second scripture reading here is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. You know, many people are looking in the wrong place for the real meaning of life. What would you consider as fake sources of meaning? You know, I have, had, I have had many people tell me they believe in science, not God. And I tell them I believe in real science and God. People also think the meaning in life is in, the, is in position and power and wealth. With those definitions, if those are things that define, you know, position, power, and wealth are not being surrendered to God, and to God's will, then they really have no real meaning. It's only in our relationship to God. This poetic text here that we read takes us through a robust list of things human experience on earth, both positive and negative. How does this portion of the text speak to our experience as humans? You know, here we find a list of things, of many things that we have experienced and many possibility of things that we might yet experience. We need to realize that these are referred to as the seasons that we find ourselves in. And I think we need to remember that uh, we know from nature that seasons do not last forever. Seasons come and seasons go. And the things we experience, you know, this too shall pass, right? Which of the comparisons in the writer's list of human experiences surprised you the most and why? Oh, excuse me. Um, you know, there is not much in that list that is surprising to me because I've gotten old, I guess. However, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them seemed a bit odd in this list of things here. But I thought, as I thought about this, I decided from my experience as an engineer in construction management, I have been involved in gathering stones. And then after crushing them, we scattered them out and, and made some nice roads for people to drive on, right? So uh, 
I guess it was the time to gather stones and to uh, scatter them in a different form. So what does this list say about who God is? I think it should tell us some things about God that such as God's timing is purposeful. And that God allows for unique and dynamic human experience. I think we should also understand that God is ultimately in control. God's time and things come in our life and the seasons we experience happen the way they do for a purpose. Remember, God has a plan for your life. There's a plan to do things good and not to do us harm. Sometimes we wonder about the way they happen, whether they are good or harmful, but they all are part of God's plan for us to make us what he wants us to be. So read Ecclesiastes. Now we're going to read Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 14. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the heart, in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning of time. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toils. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Now, a common theme in the book of Ecclesiastes is that everything is meaningless. But this passage teaches us some important, meaningful things about the relationship between God and humanity. What do these verses say about who God is? Well, we find from verse 10 that God has laid burdens on humans. In verse 11, we see that God has made everything beautiful in his time and that he, his ways are unfathomable and that he has set eternity in the human heart. In verse 14, we find that God is doing what God is doing endures forever and that God is to be feared. Well, verse 9 says, He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. And in verse 13, he mentions that satisfaction in toil is the gift of God. So how might it help people, or help us, as the people of God to see everything, circumstances, experiences, everything as beautiful in its time. We noted earlier that Ecclesiastes is about perspective. As humans, our perspective is limited because we do not see the whole view as God sees it. If we look at everything, with the knowledge that God has made it beautiful in his time and look for the beauty, it may adjust our perspective. As I was answering this question, I thought of my dragon fruit cactus. Well, I actually have cacti, but anyway, it has a very large and beautiful blossom. But they start to bloom, the bloom, blossom starts to open at about as the sun goes down. 
And then in the morning when the sun comes up, the flower is already wilting. So to see the true beauty, you need to visit the plant in the dark because that is the time that it was made beautiful. And so it has a very short life, but this is a very beautiful flower. And it's very large. God made it beautiful, but just for that short period. And you know, we need to look for the beauty in the things that God is doing around us and for us. Verse 11 says that he has set <clears throat> eternity in the hearts of people. How do you react when you hear the phrase eternity in our hearts? Excuse me, I need to take a sip of water here, I think. <clears throat> so how do you react <clears throat> when you hear the phrase eternity in our hearts. You know, we were created for a relationship with God. So in, to find our meaning, and we were created to find our meaning in him, relationship with God, and that also is where the, our meaning is. Humans were created to spend eternity with God. But we can only do this if we accept Jesus, his son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. So we want to live with God. He made it that way. That is a desire. I used to say we had a God-shaped vacuum in our heart until we can fill it with God. We try to fill it with other things. Verse 14 implies that everything will happen as it should. That nothing can be added or taken away from what God does. It also offers a reason for God's act so that people will fear him. So what does it mean to fear God? I think it means that is to recognize that a relation, let me back up here. I think it means to recognize that a right relationship with God is necessary and that it also includes worshiping God, having faith in God, and loving God in one another. That's what we need to do. If we fear God, means we need to worship him, have faith in him, and realize that we have to have a relationship with him. Connect into our, to our life in the world. <clears throat> One challenge we face as humans is that of how to respond in the situations and circumstances in which we find ourselves. The world might tell us one way to respond, perhaps to be angry when things are not going as we would like and to be happy when they are. But the writer of Ecclesiastes offers several important reminders, not just to the original readers of the text, but to Christians today. Practice, content, practice contentment and patience in every circumstance and to trust God's time in. For the most part, do you think humans practice being content in every situation? I think our reaction to situations are dictated by our relationship with God. Now, I recently clicked on a video on Facebook that was the America, America's Got Talent performance of a young lady that goes by the stage name Nightbird. That's N-I-G-H-T-B-I-R-D-E. Now I will tell you up front that she was given a golden buzzer 
for her performance. This was in June 2021, June 2021 performance. So it wasn't very long ago. And she was 30 years old. And she had, and she was a cancer patient at the time. She had cancer and at that time, they asked her how she was doing and she said, uh, well, she had cancer in her lung and her liver and her spine. But, you know, she had the biggest and brightest smile you could imagine. Uh, she was dressed in those uh, jeans with holes in them and all those things. But she sang a song that she had written about the previous year of her life as a cancer uh, patient. And the name of the song was it's okay. Now, she did the performance. And before the judges voted, Simon asked her how she could be so happy with all she had gone through. And she replied, you can't wait until life isn't hard before you decide to be happy. Later on, she said, and uh, as she was leaving a little post interview thing, uh, she said that her doctor had given her a 2% chance to survive. And she said, but you know, 2% isn't nothing. I'll tell you, by the time the video was over, there were tears in my eyes. A few days later, I spoke about Nightbird to my grandson's wife, Bridget. She said, I know about her, and I want to read something that she wrote to you. So she pulled, on, pulled up on her phone a piece written by Nightbird titled, God is on the bathroom floor. Now, this is about her relationship with God. And it is inspiring. Even if it is a little unorthodox. And I think she probably is more truthful than a lot of people. When she went with what she wrote here. Part of it is how she spent time <clears throat> when very sick, laying on a mat in the bathroom, talking with God. The last paragraph reads, even on days when I'm not, too, not so sick, sometimes I go lay on the mat in the afternoon light to listen for him. I know it sounds crazy, and I can't really explain it, but God is there. Even now, I have heard it said that people can't see God because they won't look low enough, and it's true. If you can't see him, look lower. God is on the bathroom floor. If you've never heard of Nightbird, I would encourage you to Google the America's Got Talent Nightbird Golden Buzzer and Google Nightbird, God is on the bathroom floor. Now, if you can listen to her song and read what she wrote without any emotion, uh, maybe you know, if we can do that, maybe we need to spend some time on the bathroom floor. Why is it important for us as Christians to practice contentment? God has a plan for our life and it is to do good for us. So trust him and give thanks in, in, in everything. 
Are we content with what God, our Heavenly Father, provides for us or plans for us? In light of our life here on earth, with a time to be born and time to die, uh, compare that to eternity with him. Hmm. I think we need to be content with what God is doing. How might we begin to practice trust in, in God's timing? This is the lesson book's answer. Praying for peace and contentment, reading the word, sharing life with other Christians. Now, if you've watched these lessons, then you probably know my answer. PRP, praise, read, and prayer. In light of the text, what wisdom could we offer to those who feel discouraged about their life circumstances? Verses 12 and 13 tell us, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. We need to remember, everything is beautiful in its time, and God always loves us. And he always shows us grace. It is a gift that he gives us. Now for a little homework for your part here. So get quiet before God and think about the following questions. Think about how they apply to your life. If you were to ask God for one thing to make the present moment more meaningful, what would it be? If you were to have your prayer answered, how would it change your relationship to God? How would it change your relationship to your co-workers, to your family? Or to your unsaved neighbors? If God gave you exactly what you think you need, how does it affect your relationships? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we uh, just want to praise you for all that you've done in our lives and the fact that you do make everything beautiful in its time and that you do give us good gifts god and uh watch over us and that you are always faithful you're always there with us through good times and bad and even when we can't explain it just as uh, all the pain and sorrow and things that happen like in the story that uh, nightbird tells we just Know, Lord, that you're still right there, and uh, you're where we can meet you, even if it might be on the bathroom floor, Lord, that we will have our place that uh, we can uh, truly meet you, meet with you, and you're always there for us. And we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue. We know that they are those who are ill and have had problems, and we just pray, Lord, that you would just touch them and comfort them. And uh, we think of uh, Sandy and Ron there in Ohio, that you'd be with them and uh, touch Ron and uh, 
as he's going through a difficult time medically and just uh, we pray for him. And um, we think of Jay and Debbie and they continue to carry on. And uh, the uh, and Consuela and others, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, continue to be with us in a special way each day and uh, help us to reach out to others that uh, the things that we would like to see change our life and make it better would also change the life and the relationship with others that our unsaved neighbors would uh, come to to know you through our actions and that uh, you would let the holy spirit deal upon their hearts and draw them to you and uh, our unsaved relatives and family and friends and those around the world in jesus precious name we ask him amen well, good. That's the end of our lesson for today. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, that you guys have a great day and a great week. And uh, remember that uh, God does love you. And uh, so do I. <laughs>